And today's topic is going to be on holiness. So I think holiness is something that um, not a lot of people want to talk about. I'm not sure why, but I think people desire it, and I think that they want it. So I think it's going to be our goal to talk about holiness, and with that, another side topic will be mortification. And a lot of people will be confused about what those topics mean, but hopefully we can figure it out here very soon. But first, let's start off in prayer, and we'll also end in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we just ask you that you will be with us today. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and allow us to be able to talk about these subjects of holiness and mortification. And we ask you, Lord, that you will just be able to empower us with the ability to act out on that faith. And we ask this all through Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alright, so holiness. A lot of people think about holiness and they question what is it? Is it simply doing the right thing? Is it being a good person? Is it moving our path on the way to things that are better? I think it can be all those things, but it has to be your why behind it. And if your why behind it is not proper, it's not good, it's not just, um, and you have some kind of selfish intention, you're never going to be able to reach the point of holiness. So the goal is not to be able to just do the right thing. It's why am I doing the right thing? So one of the reasons that I want to combine what we call holiness and mortification in on the same subject is that they go together. And I think a lot of people are going to be very confused on what mortification means. So let's find out a definition for holiness and let's find out a definition for mortification. And once again, anybody listening that has a comment, that wants to share something, uh, wants to switch topics briefly and discuss something, by all means, I would say go ahead and do that. And let's truly find a way to make it so that in the end of this, every single day, by the end of our talking together, that we're going to get better and we're going to be able to act out our faith. And for anybody that is not a Catholic, uh, that might be a Protestant, that might believe in a different um, faith altogether, well, don't feel like you can't say something either. Because our goal is to uh, talk about things, find ways to make sure that we're living out the faith properly. And although my goal would be for anybody that's not Catholic to be Catholic, uh, it's not that we're going to all of a sudden tell you that you are a terrible person because you're not. So let's, let's start off with that basis. But first, what exactly is holiness? So I think holiness is going to be something that is going to allow us to be able to slowly conform to the image of Christ and that we're going to be able to work our way to say, you know, this journey is tough, but if I keep on doing things that are going to allow myself to shape myself into the image of Jesus, then we're going to be able to slowly work our way into our ultimate goal, which is going to be heaven. So if we're not the kind of person that's going to be looking for how I can conform closer and closer to Jesus, we're going to have our entire direction thrown off base and there's not a possible way we're going to be able to get to be holy unless we know why we are trying to be holy. Now, a lot of people think, you know, being holy could be one that's really reserved, that's really calm, maybe doing a bunch of good things uh, all the time. And all those things are, are, are right and proper in their own time. You know, a lot of people will realize, you know, hey, that person's just so reserved. They're just doing such a good job. Um, but, you know, I wish I could be like them. I wish I could be like this person that's so calm. Uh, or they might say, you know, that person, every time I'm with them, they seem to do something that either helps the poor, uh, you know, helps a fellow co-worker, helps a complete stranger on the streets, whatever it might be, that person's going to be attractive in a different way on the holiness side. But the goal is going to be, why are we doing any of this? So being holy is not just something about doing good acts, although it includes that. But if we're simply doing it just to do it, well, then I would argue you're a good person. You're doing what society would tell you that you're supposed to do. And if it's not the type of societal influence, then why else would I do it? This is a common thing that a lot of people talk about. I'm just going to be a good person to be a good person. And it's going to eventually help somebody. I've got a lot of people that I know that, that do this on a daily basis. And in some ways, they probably do it better than many of the Christians out there. 
they just for some reason feel that it's the right thing to do to reach out and to help and they don't feel right if they don't do that however the the good catholic and the good christian is going to realize that there's a why behind it and the why behind it is trying to be jesus to other people now i understand that can be really cliche and a lot of people could just say oh you know you're just saying that you know everyone always just says try to be more like jesus but you know rarely do i see anybody being like jesus well that's true then i would agree <laughs> to many ways i would agree because our, our why is completely messed up our why needs to be why am i doing this and ultimately the answer has to be that it is because we want to love people more if love is not behind it, which is the greatest commandment of all, then we're not going to be able to do pretty much anything that's going to be able to help us. And if we're not loving people, our why is going to be completely messed up. It could be completely around, or it could even be a selfish reason. People say that I'm going to do good things for others so that I will be recognized. That's a very dangerous thing. We, we do not want to do things in order to be recognized. If we purely do things to be recognized, then it's going to be the selfish motive behind it, which, like anything, will eventually come out and everyone will know that you're doing this just to be noticed, or just to be seen, or just to be heard. And nobody likes people that have selfish motives. And unlike popular belief, I actually think you can point out a selfish belief pretty easily. So I think if people aren't focusing on that, you know, they're going to have a real big problem. So holiness, once again, is being able to fight uh, for the good fight, basically doing what's right, conforming to Jesus. But your why behind it has to be that you want to love and help and assist the person to whom you're speaking to, or that you may just do an action to. Now, mortification goes along with this really well. And a lot of people, uh, I feel like they have this view of mortification that it is the type uh, where you do something wrong and you see, you see the people on the movies, you know, slapping themselves or hurting themselves, you know, realizing that I have, I have to mortify myself, somehow inflicting pain. Uh, and that's in no way, you know, what, what mortification is at all. So I want to make sure people know that, you know, mortification is more uh, on the path of trying to become holy. So mortification could, in some sense, being the little sacrificial things every single day that's going to lead you into your ultimate goal, goal once again, which is our why, is to become holy and more like Jesus. So mortifying might be something like you're, you're in the car, you're driving, and then somebody just happens to be, you know, going insane next to you. And, you know, you feel like saying something you shouldn't, um, giving them a gesture that you probably shouldn't give them, or thinking a bad thought about them, or, or, or a combination of some, or what's even worse, some people get road rage and they end up running into somebody, or, um, you know, hurting them physically. But mortification would be the, the sense where, even if you want to do that, and it's okay to have a human emotion, I mean, we are humans, so even if you want to do that, it would be something to where you would stand back for a second and say, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that because I truly want things to be better. I, I, I want this person to conform to holiness, I want personally to conform to holiness, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say no to that, and I'm going to fight for myself and my own salvation so that I have absolutely nothing to worry about. But mortifying yourself has so much more to do than just saying, you know, I don't want to do it, so I shouldn't do it. No, no, mortification is going to be something to where we want to fight for what is right slowly and little by little. It could be as easy as, you know, you being at a restaurant. Let's let's say you're a smoker and <clears throat> you're outside and there's a bunch of, there's a family right next to you and you, you happen to be a smoker and you really want to smoke right now. But you know that the people next to you, mainly the children at the table and whatnot, they may not want to smell that. So then what do you do? You realize, I'm not going to smoke for this moment because it might affect them. And that's always the goal is finding what's going to be better for the other people. And that's how you slowly conform yourself to holiness, by knowing that if you make small sacrifices all the time, that you're willing to do what is right, you'll slowly develop a new mindset, and your why is going to be much more than, well, I just don't think it's the right thing to do, into saying, I don't want to do that because it might affect them, it might help them, it might truly make them, make them grow in holiness, 
Or there might be a way that you could even, you know, impact somebody's salvation. But the holiness and mortification is such, uh, such an interesting topic that that's why we're going to talk about it. So now that we kind of understand what mortification and holiness is, our goal is now going to be to talk about it. And um, I'd love to hear from anybody that happens to have a story or wants to talk about a question uh, that you might have. If you have any questions at all, it doesn't have to be on this specific topic, but if you have any question that you want to know about the Catholic faith, um, about what other religions believe, um, you know, why we believe that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, or anything in between, um, you know, please feel free to uh, ask a question. And if I can answer it, I will. If I can't, um, we can find out the answer together. But let's talk, let's talk about um, what we can do, some good topics of holiness. So I think that's going to be the key for today, is to find out what are some good things we can do. Well, I think let's start out with the most simple one, which is uh, simple, at least in my mind, but I understand it may be uh, a bit trying for some. It's going to be praying. Now, praying is a great thing. And I know a lot of people like to mask it under, you know, hey, I'm going to meditate on something, or I'm going to, or I'm going to think about it. Um, you know, it's, you know, as much as I appreciate them saying something and taking some effort to do something different, thinking about something or purely wondering about it or meditating on it is not going to do anything. And I have to make that perfectly clear. Thinking about something or meditating on it is not going to help. It's not going to help anybody. What would help is somebody praying about it. And I would, I would uh, even argue that you should go against the typical grain that you see with people, and they wonder, you know, hey, if something's going on, they say, you know, hey, I'll pray for you. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll pray for you. The question should be, why aren't you praying right now for them? Why don't you want to pray right now? Because if you're like me, you're going to forget about it, and you actually will end up not praying for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or it could be you know, a day or a week. And if you remember it and you do it and you're intentional about it, that's good too. You know, God works outside of time and space. And, you know, we don't, he doesn't need to be confined by our, you know, one second opportunity to pray for somebody. That's not the goal. But the goal is that you need to be a man of your word. And this is how we get back to the holiness and the mortifying yourself. If your goal is to be holy, if your goal is to be right, if your goal is to be just, if your goal is to be good, and you want to do that with the why in the end of everything that you do, mainly getting to heaven and conforming to Christ. If that's what you're going to do, then you need to ask yourself those questions every time you do anything. So if we're praying for somebody and it happens to be a situation where, you know, someone asks for prayer, stop everything you're doing and pray for them. Just pray for them right away. And I guarantee you that the graces that they receive and the graces that you receive in that moment are going to be greater than you could ever imagine. And some people might say, well, I don't, I don't hear anything from God. Uh, how could he possibly make a, make a difference or a change? How could he do that? Well, that person that you prayed for, I guarantee is probably going to be in the situation where they've never had anybody actually pray for them. Out loud, in public, wherever it might be. And they'll say, hey, this is a little bit different. Like, this is completely different. Um, you know, I, you know, a lot of people say they're going to pray for me, but you actually did. Is, is that going to make a difference? Yeah, you better believe it will. Absolutely it will. It's going to be the kind that's going to allow you then to impact somebody's life. And then more importantly, <clears throat> what are you going to be able to do after that? Follow up with them. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them if there's something different that you might be able to help them with. Or, how, hey, how's this going? I know we prayed about this a few times, or we prayed about it one time. I want to know if that's gotten any better. What else can I do to help you? And what you're doing is you're, you're displaying that not only do you care about them, not only do you love them and you want what is better and what's best for them, but you're, but you're realizing that you're making an impact on their lives. You've now gained trust with that person. So praying with somebody allows you to not only just, you know, to be heard, which obviously is, is kind of pointless in prayer, just to be heard, but you're impacting somebody's life because you're showing that your faith is now brought forth in action. And that's, a, and that's an amazing way that we can conform to holiness and to mortifying yourself. <clears throat> so, also with prayer, 
not just praying for other people, it's making sure that we pray for uh, ourselves, for our family, for our friends. And what scripture tells us is those that do things in secret, the Lord will reward them in secret. So it's not just something that you want to be heard by anybody that you're praying for. You want to make sure that you are praying on your own, that you're praying in the quietness of your own soul, that interior life is being formed. And what that will allow you to do is have a relationship with the Lord that is going to allow you for those spontaneous moments that you may be wanting. That will lead to additional times of prayer with other people. It will allow you to impact their lives in a very, very incredible way. And through that, you might just see more opportunities from the Lord come about you to say, I've entrusted you with this, you've handled it well, so now let's go ahead and see if you can handle this well. And it's very important that we do that, to be open to the Holy Spirit, viewing things that we need to do. Because in the end, what are we? We're priest, we're prophet, and we're king. And we need to be willing to do all of those. A lot of people say, well, what does that mean? What does priest, prophet, and king even mean? Well, what does a priest do? A priest offers sacrifices. And even though we're not ordained as a priest, uh, we can still make sacrifices in our own life, in our walk with Christ, in this entire journey that we have to get to heaven. Once again, going back to the why. Why are we doing anything? So this goal would be for us to be able to say, I'm going to make a sacrifice for others and for the Lord, that I'm going to do what's right in order that I can impact their salvation. And if you're being an impact on their salvation, it will directly be an impact on your own salvation. And you're going to see a lot of different things come out of that. And then other people will see your holiness. Other people will see your love. And they will realize that something is different. And that different is you actually acting out on the faith. So that's how we become a priest. A prophet is not someone that knows the future, even though it can be in some way. But this isn't really what the biblical sense of a prophet is going to be. <clears throat> there were many prophets in the Old Testament uh, that foretold things that came true. Uh, you know, and there's about, you know, oh, there's over 300 of them that Jesus fulfilled on his own. So if you want to talk about, hey, this is going to happen, this is when it's going to happen, this is who it's going to be involved with, that happened all the time. But the way that we can be a prophet and someone that would prophesize, which is something you even hear in the Old Testament, is someone that's going to speak truth. Someone that's going to speak the truth of the Lord and do it in a way that is going to edify the body. Um, and if, you, if you're just speaking at random and you don't really know what you're talking about, um, it can help a very small percentage of people. And there's going to be those people out there that are going to go, oh, I needed to hear that. Other people are going to go, this guy's crazy. But there's a way to do it that's simple, that's good. And it's just, you know, and I, and as cliche as it might be, it needs to be the way of you talking just like Jesus would and acting the way that Jesus would. This allows you then to find a way to speak the truth. You can speak the truth in love. You can be harsh when you need to be harsh. You can call out a sin when it needs to be called out that it's a sin. Um, you can help somebody in the moment that they need to be helped. You can do all these things because your ultimate goal, once again, is to conform to holiness, which means you're going to conform to the image of Christ. So in the moment where something comes up, uh, let's say you happen to be discussing something amongst friends or amongst family members to where, uh, you know, maybe a contentious topic is coming up or one that's not very popular in the, in the current uh, political sphere. You know, you have two options. Either I speak the truth and I get really angry and I just start you know, yelling and screaming and calling people names and doing a bunch of that stuff, which is something we hear constantly. <laughs> every moment we hear it, no matter what news station you turn on. <laughs> or it could be the kind of person that says, well, let me tell you why I don't agree. And then ask a follow-up question. You're speaking the truth, you're helping them, you're making them do better, but at the same time, you're going to allow them now to see that you're reserved, that you're working on uh, being controlled in what you say, how you say it, what you're supposed to say, and then they're going to realize that something's shifted. Something completely different has now taken place. So then out of that, what can you do differently at this point? You can now realize that there's going to be a different way of acting. That holiness that you've been working so hard to is now going to be able to be put into action. And that into action is going to allow them then to say, 
well, what's changed? What happened to be different? Like, why didn't you get angry this time? Why didn't you follow through in the way that you normally would? And your, and your answer can be, you know, and, and this is not cliche to say it. It's what Jesus would want of me. So it's very, hey, thanks so much for the subscription. I really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. I uh, hope you enjoy it. We're going to be here every single day. Uh, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, our goal is to conform to holiness. Uh, and we're going to do that by talking about the faith. I think it's something that's going to be very edifying. And it's not very common on Twitch either, so I think that hopefully this will be something great. So feel free to interact, talk, but I appreciate that very much. It means a lot. So we're talking about um, praying right now and good ways to conform to holiness and good ways to conform to uh, mortification of our bodies. And we're talking about praying. So, and a lot of times this will come up where we need to realize how do we pray? And if there's a moment to where you realize that you know how to pray or you want to pray differently, the goal is going to be the ultimate why behind everything. So this is the goal of what we're talking about. Why are we doing anything? And the reason why we would pray is because we want to ultimately conform to the Lord, but it's because we want to help people and we want them to know the truth. And there's no more loving thing you can do than to pray for somebody. So going back to our standard ways of the way that we can conform to holiness and mortify our body, we are talking about priest, prophet, and king. We went over that a priest makes sacrifices, and to be one with the faith and to be a good Catholic is going to require an immense level of sacrifice. Um, but it's all for the greater good, and the why is going to be behind it. Why? is because we want to get to heaven, and we want to bring as many people on the way as we possibly can while we're on this journey. So we talked about um, also that a prophet is somebody that will speak the truth. It's not knowing the future by any means, but it's someone that is going to be able to speak the truth. And you can speak the truth in love, and other times you're going to have to speak the truth and be a little bit more intense about it. But the ultimate goal is going to be why. And intention is very, very big on the faith, something that we should probably talk about for just a moment. The intent behind anything that you do behind anything that you say, but behind anything that you act is more important than what's currently happening. And really think about that for a second, because it's not whether or not I did something right or wrong. That's just a symbol of the, of the, of the normal law that would be in life. Is something right? Yes. Is something wrong? Yes. We can all agree that murder is wrong, and we can all agree that telling the truth is right. Those are two very common things that a lot of people could agree on whether faith is involved or not. A lot of people could agree that stealing is wrong, um, or making up for what you did wrong is right. And we don't need to be a Catholic, or we don't need to be a faithful person to understand that. But the difference behind a lot of the things that we do is the intention behind it needs to be pure. And how can we say that things need to be pure? Well, let's take, let's take something um, that a lot of people might realize could be a little, I don't know, contentious, I suppose. So let's say that you're talking about somebody, and we're going to talk about gossip here for a moment, because I think a lot of people could realize that they struggle with it, it's not right to do, um, but how do I get out of this realm of doing gossip? So how do I still speak truth, which is what we're talking about being a prophet, how do I still speak truth and not talk about somebody bad? <laughs> and trust me, I struggle with it too, it's very, very difficult at times. But the goal is going to be, what is the intent behind what you're talking about? If you're talking with somebody and you realize that something came up in your mind that you want to bring up that someone else said and it has a good intent behind it, like I'm about to tell you this because I need to learn better from it and we need to understand how to work through this situation. So I'm going to tell you somebody that, something that someone said so that you can help me through this and we can learn better. Now if that's the goal of bringing up something that somebody might have said, you're not doing it in a negative way. You're not doing it in a way that's going to directly defame their character. You're not going to do it in a, in a way that's going to make someone not like them. You're doing it in a way where I'm only telling you this with the intention behind it that you're going to help me. So at that point, it wouldn't be gossiping because we're humans. We, we have to discuss things. We have to figure things out. So that would be the goal behind it. Now, if in that same situation, if you're talking to somebody and you realize that 
oh hey, let me, let me tell you that what someone else did to me, and and I can't believe they did it, you know. And then you start rambling on about them about how terrible of a person they are, and you know, eventually you get to the thing you really wanted to tell them, but you add in a bunch of this commentary that's completely not helpful whatsoever. Well, what was the intent behind that? The intent behind that, one could argue, was just for you to complain about them or to say something terrible, which in, in turn, what's going to happen to the person that you're talking to? That person now is going to have a completely negative view of the person that you just talked about. So your intention was not pure. And it's completely different than if you're having a conversation and, you know, hey, while we're on this topic, you know, let me tell you about something that happened yesterday, happened to involve this person, and, you know, I just want to know if I was right, if I was wrong, and you keep it purely at that. You didn't gossip about anybody, and you didn't defame their character, because we are all flawed humans, and we're going to make mistakes. But the intention behind it was to get better. So at the same time as you now being a, uh, a prophet, one could say, you're speaking the truth, but you're doing it with the better why behind it, which is to get better, and to, clo and to get closer to holiness, so that this journey to heaven is a little bit easier. So that's how you can be a prophet, speaking the truth. Now, how can you be a king? Remember, priest, prophet, and king. That's what we're called when we're baptized. The king, what did, what did a king used to do? A king used to take care of the poor. Now, unfortunately, we have completely different views on how the poor should be taken care of. But the interesting thing I find is that everyone acknowledges that there is the poor. And this doesn't have to be in some third world country or some fourth world country, second world country, or first world country like the United States. There can, be, um, there can be poor people in any single area. Now, that does not mean necessarily poor just with the financial stake. That can be poor in spirit as well. But a king of old used to go out to his kingdom and go out to his people and help them. So a king was somebody that truly was seen as somebody for the people, somebody that could help them. He would speak truth. He would walk about and offer assistance try to find ways of making life better. That's what kings of old used to do. Nowadays, our ideas of what kingship or what a president should be or what a leader should be is what are you going to do for me? And that's not always the best intent. We've, we've talked about intention quite a bit and every single time we talk, we're gonna talk about intention more and more because the intentionality behind something or the intention behind why we say, we do, we act or think anything ultimately means more than our actions. But if you're going to be a king to this world, you don't need to have some high government uh, position. You don't need to be in, in charge of anything. You can go out and say, I know what I can do to impact somebody. I know what I can do to impact the American people. I know what I can do to impact other countries' people. We're all people and we're, we're all souls individually. And if we don't realize that everything we do has to have the intention behind it of showing the love of Christ to other people and also realizing that if I can be a small aspect in this journey to them, it's worth it. And that could be something as easy as buying someone a cup of coffee. It could be telling them that they're loved by God. It could be showing them a small act of sacrifice to say, you know, I happen to be late to a meeting right now, but I, I want to take a moment and see if I can help you. And on this topic, I even remember hearing a story, I think it was last year, where there was a woman that was uh, you know, driving right next to a coffee shop, and she saw a homeless person there. Now, the easy thing would have been, anyone hearing this story, could have been to just drive straight past them. And I think we all do that on probably a daily basis. We drive by somebody that's either holding up a sign that says, I need food, I need money, I need assistance, or... They could be the rare message where they don't want anything. They just want to say, God bless you, which is incredible. And they should be praised for that. And they are. But this woman driving past this homeless person realized that there was a call, something that she had to do. She felt called by the Holy Spirit to do something different. So she stopped. She got out. She talked to the person and invited them to have coffee at the coffee shop that was right next to them. Now, I don't know if this person, the last time they ate, the last person they drank, I have no idea. But, the, the, but this is a true story, and what the woman ended up doing was talking to that person and have coffee with them. 
And that homeless man told that woman, if you wouldn't have stopped, I was going to jump off the bridge. Now really think about that. If you wouldn't have stopped and done something different. Art, what's up, buddy? If you wouldn't have stopped and done something different, that person would have killed themselves. So that's going to be a completely different thing that we have to realize that there is something we can do to impact the world. Um, we have a choice every single day where we're going to choose whether or not something is right. And in that moment, that person was willing to make the sacrifice that something's going to be a little bit different. And through that, they were then willing to say, it's worth it. And I would ask the same question for, for everybody listening. Is it worth the actions we're doing? Can it truly make a difference? Can it be impactful on other people and on ourselves? Is there something that we can do that's going to change someone's life? And ultimately, if, if your answer to that question is, it's not worth it, I just don't believe that. I'll, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't believe that. Because I think we all have the ability, the innate ability, whether or not faith is involved or not, I think we all have the ability to recognize that we are all here for each other. And if I can help lift up somebody else in a moment of weakness, I'm going to do it. Because I guarantee that if in our weakest moments, which I've been there, I've been in countless weak moments, if, if I'm there, I'm, see I'm searching for somebody to help me. I want someone to help me and to realize that I do need help. And that's a great sign of strength for somebody that could just come out and say, I need help. Would you mind helping me? And it could be something that could be trivial. I really just need you to help lift this into my house. But to some people that takes courage to even ask that amount of help. To other people, they may say something a little bit more deep, like, hey, I have no one to talk to about this, but something's really weighing on me and I, and I need to talk to someone. And you might be the only person that they feel comfortable bringing that up to. Or what I've done in my cases uh, with many people that I've talked to, I've had other people reach out to say, I need to share something that no one else knows. And those secrets are one where you know that it's really weighing upon them. And if you were to ever say no to those people that need help, that are begging, that are asking for help in this unique, rare moment, if you were to say no to them, would they be like the homeless man? Would they realize that nothing else is worth it now? Could that be the final straw that they would have to say that life's not worth living? It's definitely possible. It's definitely possible and it's, uh, and it's unfortunate because we have so many things that we can do for other people. And we have to realize that every single life is worth saving. Every single life is worth doing the right thing. So that's, that's a great way of doing it. Um, we talked about um, you know praying. Um, and then that got into a tangent, which is going to be pretty common. But I think things are worth explaining. Um, so, uh, if they're not worth talking about, I don't really see the point of it, but this is definitely worth talking about. And then the, the next thing that we can do is, is really to make sure, uh, that we can focus on doing what is right, not only for the right intention, but doing what is right, not because society tells us it's right, because it is right. So let's talk about that for a moment. And once again, this is how to conform to holiness and mortify yourself. So society will tell you A, B, and C, and we all know it, and we are not going to talk politics whatsoever. We will never talk politics on this channel. It is completely irrelevant, and I don't want to do it. But what we can talk about is how people react to certain things and what they're being told to say, how we should do things, and that is worth talking about. A lot of people may realize that they say, well, I, I, can't, I can't say that in the current culture. It's, it's, or I'm not allowed to believe that in the current culture. Well, does that really mean that you can't believe something? You can't say something? Because the last time I checked, we're all free souls, and we all have the right to freedom of speech, and we all have the ability to do anything, whether it's right or wrong. 
Now, a lot of people will, will seem to disagree with that, but every single day we have the choice. We have the choice to do what is right. We have the choice to do what is wrong. And if we don't choose the right thing, there's going to be consequences. If we choose the right thing, there could be consequences as well. I don't want anyone to think that doing the right thing is going to void you of consequences. They're just different. They're completely different consequences that come out of it. You know, a very easy way to understand that is what if somebody decides that they're going to um, tell a lie? Well, what's the worst that could possibly happen if somebody lies? You know, a lot of people wonder that when they are about to tell a lie. And I truly believe that people wonder about that before they even tell the lie. What impact is this going to have? And ultimately, like all things in life, they realize that it's worth doing what's wrong so that they can get the correct outcome that they want. It goes all to about intent that we're constantly talking about. Intent is key to everything. So if you realize that you're about to tell a lie and that you have thought about the consequences and it is worth it to you, then you're going to do it. And there's not a single soul on this planet that can stop you from doing it. And you have to be willing to make the sacrifice that to say the consequences are now worth it. And this goes back to how do we become holy? Why are those consequences worth it? Why are they worth it at all? And are they really worth it? To me, if somebody's lying and they get caught it, there could be multiple things that could happen. You could lose a friendship. See, we have a question. How can you not bring up politics when the Romans are prosecuting people of faith? It seems larger we can't afford anymore. Well, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I suppose, let me, let me go back and uh, let me think how we could better say that. To talk about the current political sphere, I think, is going to be something that we're not going to want. Well, maybe we will end up talking about it, but it's not going to have a political agenda. you got to remember that the, the, the time of the Romans, that they were something called the Judaizers, and they were trying to, um, you know, they were trying to convert as many people as they could um, for a certain, certain belief. And then we have, you know, a hero of the faith. We have St. Paul come in to say, I'm going to talk against this. So it's not necessarily that we're not going to bring up politics because there might be some political nature, and there is a political nature to the church. There's a political nature to society. But there is not going to be a political agenda uh, that is going to say, you know, you have to be a Republican or you have to be a Democrat in order to for this conversation to make sense. I believe that as, as much as I love government, as much as I love the idea of politics, it has been it has been convoluted into a pool to where people say it's no longer about what's right and what's proper and what's just. It's whether or not you agree with me. And the great thing about talking about the faith is what St. Paul did to the Romans, to your point about politics, a luxury we can't afford anymore. It's something that we have to be able to speak the truth about everything that we're doing. We have to be able to speak the truth about who Christ is, about who his church is, what he commands of us. And through that love and discussion, we're going to be able to bring people to the faith, which is the same thing Paul did to those Judaizers when he wrote the entire book of Romans. So feel free to follow up with any question you might have. I, I, I appreciate it very, very much. Um, we have to talk about things like this and no question is off limits. Uh, we have to talk about things that are challenging, things that are tough. We have to talk about the truth. In the end, the intention, like we're going to talk about, and you're going to hear the word intention more than anything, um, on all these shows every single day, is because we have to realize that the intention behind why we do or don't do anything is ultimately the goal of our holiness. So going back to a political thing, let's actually bring up a political uh, conversation that we were talking about. So. Um, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, well, we shouldn't talk about this. Now, I don't really think that's, that's, that's not really careful right now. Or, or with the current culture, I don't think that we should. That's how a lot of these conversations turn out. Well, what I realized is that it's not that we don't want to talk about certain topics that may be political in nature, but there's a bigger root to them. 
there's a much bigger root on what someone can do and what someone can't do. And if they're not willing to make the sacrifice to say that my ultimate intention behind bringing this up is that so people can get better, so that I can get better, so that society as a whole can get better, and that I can be a better faithful member to my Lord, then I think that's worth bringing up. I think it's worth bringing up completely, all day long. Talk about it with as many people as you can. But what I see so common in the political sphere right now is people not to say, I want to bring this up so that I can understand better. It's that I want to bring this up so that other people can now understand me better. I hope that makes sense. But there's an intention behind why we're bringing it up in the first place. And if we're not someone that wants to bring it up to say, I'm willing to make this sacrifice knowing that this may either hurt my friendship with somebody that I'm bringing it up to, it may enable me to realize that I'm going to have to approach this now from now on, or I'll be labeled as a, as a X, Y, and Z. Well, if you make yourself known to that person or the group of people, that listen, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I need to understand. I need to understand the other side. So once again, I, I, th I think we have to make sure that we get there. And if we're not intentional about it, we're going to fail constantly. So we, we, talked, about, we talked about praying. We talked about um, intention. We talked about becoming a priest, a prophet, and a king. And these are all ways of becoming holiness. Uh, becoming more holy, I'm sorry, and mortifying one's soul to the Lord. I want to have a few other practical things. And once again, this, this is a completely um, Catholic stream, but anybody that would happen to be a Protestant, an atheist, um, uh, a Muslim, um, anybody that believes in any other type of religion, you can still join in. You can ask whatever questions you want. Even if you disagree with me, that's okay. Because we're going to talk about it. And that's the goal, is to talk about things. And my goal is to be ultimately intentional about everything we talk about. And if somebody has a question worth asking, I think it's worth answering and not giving a one second answer to it as well. And thankfully, I'm, uh, I'm not short answered, so um, I don't think that will ever happen. <laughs> but some of the other things we can do to uh, make sure that we are conforming to this, to this faithful life um, is really acknowledging that we need help. That's the first step. We are not all perfect. And I certainly know I am not perfect, perfect in any possible way. But I also know that our Lord has called us to be perfect. And I know that it's possible with his help and with the Holy Spirit's help. So I can do it. The question is not whether I can, it's whether I'm, I want to. And if we don't want to conform closer to our Lord, if we don't want to conform closer to holiness, if we don't want to slowly surrender our lives and make small sacrifices for the betterment of our own soul and of others, one would have to then ask the question, what is the goal of even being in the faith to begin with? Why are you, uh, why are you a believer? Why are you a Catholic? Why are you not a Catholic? Why are you an atheist? We have to answer the why to anything. And we have to be able to give a reason for the defense of why we believe in something. So if we're not willing to make those sacrifices, or if we realize that uh, our faith only takes us to a certain point, and then after that, faith goes out, out the door, and only my logical assent and my reason comes into play at that point, it's not that that's wrong to think that way, but the question is, is it right? Should I stay there? Is my intentionality behind this one that I want to now change my life completely over to Jesus, or that I don't want to do that? So if we're not intentional about why we're even in the faith to begin with, it's a question that needs to be asked. Now, what are some other things we can do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ramble them off quickly. Um, and we, we're going to get to many topics on this in the days ahead. Um, but it's going to be going to confession. Letting, letting God know that you're sorry for your sins. Being sorrowful for them. You know, having the right contrition to your, to your sins. And this contrition can be perfect or imperfect. And if we remember, a perfect contrition is one that is 
is so, so saddened that they have offended God that they have to then confess their sins. Imperfect contrition has to do with, I don't want to go to hell right now. And both are logical uh, and natural reasons for one to go to confession. But if our ultimate goal is not to conform closer to that perfect contrition, to where we know that we don't want to offend God anymore, it's going to be a long uphill battle. And it will be no matter what. We have a long time to sanctify our souls. And our goal is ultimately to get there. And it's going to be so many sacrifices on the, along the way. It's going to be so many moments to where you're going to question and battle with what's right and what's wrong. But let me tell everyone here right now, as we, as we close, is that the journey is worth it. I want to let everyone know that the journey of the faith with our Lord Jesus is worth every single moment. There's going to be uphill battles. There's going to be battles that you don't think are worth fighting. There's going to be battles that are absolutely worth fighting. There's going to be battles that you're going to have to fight for other people. There's going to be battles you're going to have to fight for yourself. And the one thing I will tell everyone to do is that if your cross is heavy and you need help, tell someone to lift it up for you. Tell them that you need help in that moment, that my cross is too heavy. I can't do this on my own, and I need help. You need help in such a great way that they can help lift that burden off for you for a moment. And if it allows you to breathe in that moment, that person helps you. They may have saved your life. They may have saved your soul. But I will also tell you that in the one moment that your cross is light, and I really mean your cross is light, I'm going to tell you right now, do not accept the lightness of your cross. Go out and be Jesus to the world and find out who needs help lifting their cross. Because in that moment, when your cross is light, you can, someone else's cross is so heavy, is so burdensome, it's so unbelievably painful, that if you don't say yes to the Lord in that moment, let the Holy Spirit change what you're doing and go a different direction for the betterment of that person's soul, then you need to realize, what do I need to do to get there? Because every single life is worth dying for, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? There's no greater thing you could do than to lay down your life for others. And what did he do for us? He laid down his life for us, knowing that he would die, not so that we can do whatever we want, so that we can fulfill the greatest commandment, which is love, and to love one another. And we can only do that by lifting each other's cross. I see St. Michael intercede for us, um, absolutely. My patron saint is St. Jude. Um, I've got a great devotion to St. Michael um, and St. Raphael and St. Gabriel and so many other saints and angels that we talk about. <clears throat> and I can't wait to do something to where we need to talk about the intercession of the saints. And that might even be tomorrow's topic. Oh, we've got a question here. Let's see. Politics is relevant to the topic of holiness, I think. Where's the line between being separate and being complicit with the larger culture, including its politics? before you compromise holiness, not just in a political way, but it seems more and more participating, even in an economic way, feels wrong. Well, I think that's that's gotta be a fantastic question. I don't know if you could have phrased it a better way either. And in some way, um, to both of your points, politics is relevant, but the ultimate why behind it is going to be why are we doing anything? So when we look at here and we say, where's the line between being separate and being complicit with the larger culture? Well, I think I can answer that, and, and hopefully I'll offer some, some guidance on, on what I think. Because it's pretty easy to be complicit, let's, let's be honest. But it's, it's easy to be complicit, and the reason why, I go back to why, and you'll, you'll, you'll probably get tired of me saying the why, but that is the reason. So here's the differentiator. Here's the difference. We're going to have two sides. On one side, it's going to be that you messed up. It's completely out of the blue. It is not the norm. 
and you accidentally went a little too far into something and you could have been complicit in trying to be separate from everything but now you get really passionate about something and you kind of join in and then you're complicit in some ways to the larger culture and that would absolutely be political now if that's completely not the norm it means it probably doesn't happen very often and you've reserved yourself enough to say I'm not sure that's worth taking the risk and saying that or I'm not sure it's worth in taking the risk and doing that now if that's the mindset that goes through and we're thinking through things before we say them, before we do them, and we have determined that it is a right and a good and a just thing in our faith and it's edifying to the body, and more importantly, we're not going to offend God in the, in, in the means to the end, then it might be worth something that you can be fighting for. And one thing that I would say would be a good understanding of that would be um, the unfortunate um, atrocity of abortion. You know, ab abortion is inherently wrong um, because it is completely, um, you know, the killing of babies. It is not right. Uh, there is never a just reason for it because every single life is worth saving. And if we're the kind of person that realizes that it's the right thing to do, um, but at the same time, we're going to be fighting for the other side to say, well, let's not offend anybody. Let's not, uh, let's not get too aggressive on this. Let's be careful. Um, even though I know it's wrong, but, you know, maybe it could be right for somebody else in a given moment. And then you start talking about the culture. As much as I hate to say it, you've, you've become complicit at that moment. You become complicit because now you're giving an excuse of why you believe a certain way. But also, at, at the different time, if you are the one that would say, abortion is wrong in all cases, then let me tell you why. Because God loves everybody, and every single life deserves that, and I'm not going to debate on what the right or wrong way is. The only thing I can say is that God loves you, God loves that child, and he wants nothing more than the chance of salvation for the mother's soul, the father's soul if they're involved, that child's soul which he's going to have mercy on no matter what. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to be what's best for you. And if anybody's like me, I could even tell a private story where I know people that have had abortions and they say they almost always regret it. We hear statistics say that they almost always regret abortion. So you could say, I don't want you to be in the same place because I love you, God loves you, and he wants what's better for you. So now we just found a way to shift our kind of political conversation on a topic that's controversial and then shift it to still having the intention of saying the truth of God and being able to assist. Now, if we are willing to compromise our holiness, there are certain things where we have to make a differentiator. Are we allowed to be angry? A lot of times when we see about being complicit uh, and not compromising holiness, a lot of people say, are we allowed to be angry? And I think that's, and that might even be how I rephrase your question about not whether or not we're complicit or compromising. So I think the goal would be, am I allowed to be thinking this way? Am I allowed to be acting this way? And the answer is ultimately, you are allowed to be upset about something. You're allowed to be angry about something. You're allowed to be righteously upset about something. Abortion, to use that again, you're allowed to be upset about that. It's an atrocity that needs to be stopped. But if your anger allows you to be shifted and you change to hatred, you change to frustration, you change to name-calling, uh, violence in gross and disgusting ways. If that's one thing that you end up doing, then that's wrong. You've officially compromised your holiness, and you're willing to say, my anger is now worth it, because I should be angry. And I think everyone should know about it too. And there could be so many people that because of that, they are now going to realize, oh, those Christians, all they do is get angry at people. They scream at them. They complain about them. They yell at them. They, they, they say terrible things. And we've just compromised our holiness. Because as we've been talking about intention and everything else into this, what is the point of us saying or doing anything? Those people 
may have never heard the truth of the Lord. And now the first thing that they hear is how terrible of a person they are. So I would argue at that point, you have now just compromised your holiness because it's agenda-driven rather than holiness-driven. So and if we can find a way to maintain the balance of holiness and truth and love and be willing to speak the truth to people, to say that they are loved by the Lord, that they are loved more than they can ever possibly imagine. And if you'd give me five minutes, I'd be willing to share that with you. And why this decision of abortion is wrong. Now, I guarantee you do that to anybody. They are not going to immediately hate you. They might even respect you for doing something that's completely different to the culture. And through that, they may realize you might have a chance to pray for them. Not to go off a complete tangent here, but this is what's happened in my life. You say things like that to somebody, they, they lower their guard for a moment, and then you ask them, do you mind if I pray for you real quick? No one's ever prayed for me before. What if they say that? No one's ever prayed for me before. Well, let me tell you what's going to happen next. The graces, if we could see the spiritual world work, the graces that are about to be imparted on that person's soul would be the most amazing thing one could ever see. So hopefully that seems, hopefully that's a good answer um, to this, but we'll be talking about this daily, I am sure. But we don't want to participate in evil. Main key takeaway to that question is we don't want to participate in the evil that's going on. We want to be an instrument of grace. And there is a right and a wrong way to do anything. We can be driven into a political nature, but still act like Christ. Let me say that again. We can be driven by a political agenda, but we can still act like Christ to that person. And that is what saves soul. I've um, been studying the ecumenical writings of St. Pope Pius X in his, writing, in his battle with the modernist. Seems a good place to start in our day. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for saying that. It's absolutely a good place to start. Uh, and there are incredible places to start um, with many of the saints of the church, um, many of the doctors of the church. I mean, look at, look at Holy Scripture. Look at the Bible. Filled with things that are good, that are right, that are just. And ultimately, our goal is to conform ourselves to Christ. So if we read these writings, um, you know, especially Battle with the Modernist, which we is still really relevant to today, absolutely, there's a right and a wrong way to do it. And if we are battling the modernist society out of anger and frustration and hate and, and despising everyone and realizing that, you know, you know, clang in the bell as loud as you can, why isn't everybody listening to me? Well, that's not going to be a good intention. That intention, I am guarantee you, will lose souls. If we do it in the right way, it will gain them. And thanks for sharing being adopted at birth months uh, from Roe v. Wade. I often wonder, what if? Wow. What a powerful question that is. What if? I think more people need to wonder, what if? And it doesn't even have to do with abortion. What if... Uh, and this is also why the Catholic Church is opposed to contraceptive in any way, because we need to be open to life. And a lot of people uh, may say, well, those Catholics, they just don't use birth control or anything like that, and, uh, you know, I want to control my life. Well, I hate to say it, but that's the reason why the Catholic Church tells you that you cannot use it, because it's, it's, it's not your life to control. We have to be open to the willingness of life and give in to God all things that are good, that are right, that are just, that are holy. So even for someone saying, you know, listen, I'm not open to kids. I don't want kids. Well, you're not open to life. And the Lord made it so that life will be a wonderful uh, act that can bring more people. So that what if question can be said for anybody in this history. What if the mom and dad of and then fill in the blank, would have said no to life. And that person who made a incredible impact into the world 
would have never lived. And the question is not whether or not somebody else could have done it instead of them, because God's will will ultimately be done, but would have been done during the same time. Would have been done during the exact moment we needed to hear it. Could that have been done? Maybe not. And then we would have been wondering who is going to be the voice of reason in this moment. Which is a lot of times where we get some of the dark ages and we get a bunch of other things that, you know, things are scary. Things are, are really, really questionable for how society is going to turn out. But the Lord will always win in the end. And we must remember that when Christ founded his church, what did he say? The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. That's a promise we can take to the grave. Do you think economic participation compromises holiness? Buying services and products that support women's clinics or any of the things in conflict with the Bible, or perhaps, in your case, the teachings of the church? Yeah, thanks so much for asking that question. So it's, it's going to have to do with a level of participation. And this is something in, in Catholic theology that we talk about quite a bit. Um, but the participation is a leveling degree. And if you could imagine a line going across the entire screen, one side can be extremely involved, and the other one could be almost no uh, involvement at all in the sin. So let me tell you, um, uh, I guess, a business that is very, very much in question whether or not a, a, a good faithful person should be supporting them, and that would be Starbucks. Now, I, I personally, um, I like Starbucks coffee. Um, I brew it at home. I don't really want to waste the three or four or five dollars it takes. Um, but, you know, that's just my, my case. I'd rather brew it at home, but I, I love coffee. So uh, we'll, we'll brew coffee on the stream, by the way, too. So big coffee. <laughs> but at the level when you're going into a Starbucks and you're buying a cup of coffee. Now, why are we even talking about this? Starbucks is a huge supporter of Planned Parenthood. And they're a huge supporter of many things that would be, uh, one could argue, against the morality, against the truth of the church. But at that level, we have to remember, how far does that go? So to answer your question, hopefully this will answer, and please follow up with a question if it does. But the very top tier of Starbucks, the executive level of Starbucks, somebody is writing a check for millions and millions and millions of dollars to Planned Parenthood or another organization that supports a different immoral cause. If you were an executive level president or your business that you had a direct financial impact, whether writing the checks, paying for it, or whatever it might be, if your goal was to support them and you're writing the check or you cultivated those relationships and you're helping it so that the business is now supporting them, you could be complicit. And that would go back to your first question on the complicity. So if it was something to where we were saying, okay, at what level does me buying a cup of coffee have to do with any of this? And my answer would be probably zero. If, and if you want to put a percentage, maybe 0.1%. Because it has nothing to do with whether or not you like a cup of coffee. Because let me talk about the good into all of that. You buying a cup of coffee for the member at Starbucks is going to allow them to have a job, which is going to allow them to purchase a car, which may allow them to pay for childcare, which may allow them to pay for their rent. If they don't have that job, they're not going to, we're not going to be able to be faithful servants of the Lord by helping other people along their path to get to the ends that they need. And we all, unfortunately, need money. And we all need some stuff. So by you saying, I'm not going to support anybody that, dis that disagrees with me, those people still need to be able to have a job. We still need to be able to support them to some degree. Now, it would be a completely different topic if you were walking on the street and went into a women's clinic that was their main intent was abortion, and you said, you know, hey, I happen to be walking on the street, um... You know, I, I thought while I'm here, uh, I'd buy everyone a cup of coffee and drop off my $1,000 donation. At that point, it's not the coffee that was the sin. That was, an, that was an act of charity. That was an act of goodness. 
But it's the donation now to saying, listen, I'm trying to be friendly, but then you just destroyed it with a complicit act of immorality to say, here, here's a lot of money. Let's go ahead and see how much farther we can support this. Hopefully that makes sense of, of what we call about the level of involvement into the sin. So it's not going to be necessarily whether or not, just to recap, it's not necessarily at what point are we supporting somebody. It's whether or not to what level of degree of involvement do we have. And I do believe that, once again, to use Starbucks again, buying a cup of coffee from Starbucks is not remotely sinful. Um, because your level of involvement is has got to be 50 or 100 tiers lower. Um, let's see here. Um, mm -mm. Question on involuntary participation, such as taxes. Let me just read what we're talking about here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, legal option of abstaining. Uh, probably an incredible way of, of saying it. Now, it, one could also say, do we have do we have a voluntary participation into taxes? Um, and I think today is the last day taxes are due, I think, so that's a good topic to talk about. We all have a right to file our taxes. We all have a right to pay for the money that we inherit or that we make from a business, whether we own our own or we work um, for somebody else. We have a legal right and we even have the teaching of Jesus in Scripture, where he says, given to Caesar what is Caesar's, and given to God what is God's. And here's a different way of thinking about taxes, too. If we have taxes to pay, it means that we've had a good job to give us the right to where we now have an excess of money that's going to allow us now to support our family, to do what's right. Uh, or maybe even to support that, pers pers that person at Starbucks where we're going to give our $5 to them so that they can earn their hourly rate, so that they can pay for their house. And this is how we talk about the greater good in the Catholic faith. We all have an involvement with the body of Christ in some way. I may be the voice. Um, I may be the hand tomorrow. I may be the feet in two days. I may be the mind in four days. But in any way, we have to realize that there is a right and a wrong thing to do. And to involve ourselves or to abstain from something ultimately is not just whether or not it's the right or wrong thing to do. It's whether or not we're willing to make the sacrifice for Christ and for that person's soul and our own soul. Uh, let's see, our tax dollars, yours and mine, are once again funding abortions around the world without our consent. That is a really, really good point. Um, and I, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, and we can talk about that for a moment. And it goes into the level of, of remote participation. So you are correct. Our tax dollars are being used for very, very immoral things. And not just abortion. Trust me, there are countless things we could talk about. Countless things that I believe would, um, would we could be here until next Christmas <laughs> talking about if we found out what the government supports. But there is an obligation, just like once again to restate what, what the Lord says, give in to Caesar what is Caesar's, give in to God what is God's. So we have the ability to counteract that type of, of terrible uh, terribleness, I guess we could even say, if we want to just be bold about it. Now, if your tax return, here's, here's where I think you can be complicit in your tax return. If you happen to be complicit where you're filing your taxes, you get to your donation page, and on there, let's say you have uh, a bunch of good things, and then hidden in there is going to be Planned Parenthood, $1,000. Well, when you're filing your taxes, you have just expressed where your charity is going. And whether or not um, you know anybody thinks that there's a uh, you know women's health side to it, which we're not going to have that debate. I, I don't personally really uh, agree with that because um, my father is a heart doctor and uh, in terms of medical care anywhere, women's, uh, men's, it doesn't matter what it is, there's many other places that will do it and that will take care of their true health needs and not focus on abortion. So 
we have to be able to realize that if we're complicit in what we do with it, it's totally different. And you, you would have to go to confession for that because it would be seen as a uh, direct involvement in immorality and evil. So at this point, you wouldn't be participating with Christ. You'd be participating with Satan. And the evil nature that would come along from that, your donation to Planned Parenthood could end up making it so that they can fund the next five abortions. And a lot of people don't think this way. Your involvement monetarily into anything could impact their next decisions. If nobody gave money to them, they wouldn't have the ability to upkeep their employees, or the electricity bill, or anything else, and they'd be forced to go to somewhere that could take care of their own health, much better, perhaps in a Catholic type of way. That would be a better end result. So if we think about, um, what, what is it here? We can't withhold what is due to Caesar, but we do have the ability to influence the next Caesar. Yes, yes we do. Thank you for saying that. I am so glad that you said that. We do have the ability to influence the next Caesar. And this is what so many people realize that is the fundamental right as Americans, assuming, well, I live in America, so let's, let's assume the fundamental right to the Americans would be that we have to involve the election cycles, the political agenda that we've been talking about, not that we're trying to avoid talking about politics, but avoid how is the best way to do it. We can be a voice in the culture. We can do what's right. We can make those small sacrifices. We can become the priest and prophet and king in the world, knowing that I'm willing to say the truth. I'm willing to make a sacrifice. I'm willing to help the poor. I'm willing to help the mothers that think abortion's right. I'm willing to help those that, that think that, they're, that they want to do something wrong. I'm willing to do it. Why? I'm willing to do it because God loved me and died for me, so I'm going to do it for them, because he died for them too. And ultimately, if I can help any soul get to heaven, I'm going to do it. You don't need to be quiet about your voice. You don't need to, you don't need to reserve it. And you don't always need to do it in, you know, in the most politically correct nature. But you need to do it in a way that expresses love, that expresses genuine compassion, sympathy, and if, you've, if you can, empathy. I can't always empathize with everything because I've not been in those situations, but I can sympathize. And if we're willing to do all that, that's how we make the influence into the next Caesar. That is how the culture will change. And they'll realize this is becoming pretty popular to do A, B, and C, which was counter-cultural four years ago, eight years ago, 12 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. And like I said about 20 minutes ago, the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. And God loves every single one of us more than we could possibly imagine. So it's our right to influence as much as we can in the appropriate and good way that we can not only make the next Caesar, whether it's a president, uh, a king in another country, uh, a chancellor in another country, it doesn't matter what country we're talking about, we can influence it so the person that gets in there is going to make the decisions that align with what's right and what's good and he's willing to make a sacrifice so that all people are better, even if it's countercultural. I would say even more if it's countercultural, it's probably the right thing to do. Well, I want to make sure we end with. Um... Oh, here, let me let me ask. Let's see. How would one become a Catholic? As unfortunately, I've been baptized a Protestant. Oh well, we're not we're not ending the stream by any means. No, we're going to absolutely answer this. And thank you so much for asking. I I really really appreciate it. Um, and I'm a convert also. Let me, let me just first off say, I am a, I'm a convert into the Catholic faith. It took a very, very long time for me to come into the church. And all one simply has to do is I would, I would contact your local, local Catholic church, tell them you're interested in the RCIA program. That's the Right for Christian Initiation Act, RCIA. And what we do in the church is it's a nine month process. It's a beautiful nine month process where you get to get involved with everything that the faith is. You get to be explained the faith. You have many, many checkpoints to make sure that this is the decision that you want to do. And you want to make sure that you uh, truly embrace the church that Christ founded. 
And once you do that and you acknowledge, I want to become Catholic, since you've already been baptized, you don't need to be rebaptized. We're, 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 we're not rebaptizers. Unless you were baptized, I do have to make a, 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 a limiter to that. If you were baptized, and I will use quotes in this one case of baptism, in the Mormon church, we do not accept that as a valid baptism. So you would have to be rebaptized in the Catholic church. But you were not rebaptized. You would have been baptized for the first time ever. So that's a different topic. But once you go through RCIA, and once you accept the truth of the church, then you are going to be able to slowly work your way to where you will be accepted, usually at the Easter Vigil, which we do right on Easter, which just happened not that long ago. And you will take of the Most Holy Eucharist for the first time, potentially be baptized if you weren't baptized, but you were. You will be confirmed and you will gain the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you will be officially a Catholic and you can spend the rest of your life understanding that your call to holiness and your call to mortifying yourself, your call to the betterment of others, your soul and to other people, you get to be involved with what the Lord laid out for us. And that gift where he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. If you're part of the church, the gates of hell have no power over you as well. And you are able to work your way to, to holiness. So if you have any questions about becoming Catholic, uh, just send me a private message. I will help in any way I possibly can. Um, and also, um, follow me on Twitter. Um, follow me, um, you know, 2 o'clock every day. We'll probably talk for an hour and a half or two hours every day. Um, and I truly want to help. Um, and I love every single person here. Um, I want nothing more than the truth of the Lord to come upon all of us and make us better witnesses to the faith and heroes to where we can wait and hear the Lord when we get there. Well done, good and faithful servant. And that is one thing that brings tears to my eyes, to wait and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. If we spend the rest of our life preparing in holiness, we can be assured that we'll hear nothing else but that. Thanks for the follow. I really appreciate it. Let us um, finish in prayer. Does anybody have any uh, prayer request that they would like specific uh, prayer for? And I will close us in prayer. I know there's a slight delay on Twitch, so I will wait. But please, if you have something uh, you'd like prayer for, um, please let me know. And I'll give it just a moment to uh, watch the chat. Thank you so much for the subscription. I really appreciate it. It means the world to me. Thank you so much. I'll give just another moment to see if there's any prayer requests that come in. I guess we have to put into action. I guess I'll say that. Um, I'll put into, we have to put into action everything that we talk about. Every single day that we talk, or the goal is going to be, how can I put this in to action? We want to make sure that we are focusing and doing what we can in action. Repose of my son's soul, absolutely. God bless you. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, could I ask the the name of your son, please? First name, if you don't if you don't mind. If you don't want to share it, I, I completely understand. Trust me, it, it's perfectly fine. But if you feel comfortable sharing it, all right. I am going to uh, pray for us. Thank you, thank you. Nick is his name. Um, so let's really focus on prayer. Uh, let me pray for everybody. And I look forward to seeing you back uh, tomorrow to where we go on our goal of how to conform to holiness, how to live the faith out, and how to become better people and better Christians of this life. From epilepsy. I'm so sorry to hear that. Let's make sure we pray for the repose of his soul and for all of us. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful and glorious day that we have to be able to talk about you. We praise you, Lord, that there is a gospel to preach, and we thank you, Lord, that there is a message to fulfill in this world. We ask you, Lord, that uh, myself and all of our listeners right now, that we will be able to conform to the Holy Spirit, that we'll be able to be given those gifts uh, that only the Spirit can give, and that we will be able to grow in holiness, in charity, 
and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, and that that will directly impact every single thing that we do, everything that we think about, and everything that we say. We know, Lord, that the truth can impact people's souls on such an incredible level, and we ask that only through your most wonderful love that we can embrace that and be that love to other people, to which will impact the kingdom, and it will bring many, many people back to your kingdom. And we know that ultimately our goal is for heaven, so empower us with the ability to do what's right, to focus on what's right, to give people the love that you've shown us so that they will realize that there's something worth living for. I also want to ask in a very, very special and unique way for the repose of Nick's soul who died um, from epilepsy. We ask you, Lord, that you will have mercy on Nick's soul. We pray that their time in purgatory will be shortened by the love and the prayers that we are offering and that he will be able to see the perfect vision and experience you in the most wonderful and beautiful way in heaven very, very soon. And there's no doubt that Nick knows more about you than we could ever possibly know in a million lifetimes. So we ask for our prayers to go to Nick, that you will have mercy and love upon him, and that he will slowly be able to experience your beautifulness in heaven fully. And we all pray that all of us will be able to slowly on this journey work our way there so that we can all experience your love in the most perfect and beautiful way in heaven with you forever. We ask the intercession of our most wonderful mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Jude, pray for us. Venerable Fulton Sheen, pray for us. St. Pope John Paul II, pray for us. And we ask all this that the Holy Spirit will come into our lives and help us to live our faith out. We pray this all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining. Um, I look forward to this every day. Um, I look forward to praying with people more than anything and helping explain the faith. And I appreciate you being here for this uh, inaugural first episode of the Dilemma of Faith. Uh, do make sure, uh, and I appreciate all the follows, but thank you so much. It, it really does mean the world to me. And I will be coming on at random times for us to pray rosaries together, to do the Liturgy of the Hours together, um, live streams of Mass if I can, or any other event. So if there's anything you'd like to see, uh, shoot me a message. But I look forward to seeing you um, all tomorrow. And God bless you very much. And may God love you. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. God bless.